should have up on your screen 2017 spring webinar series uh, informational slide um, that if you are having audio issues um, you can dial in at 188 and uh, there's a phone number posted in the chat box as well as the email that you receive from Martha today. Um, this evening as we go through the presentation I do encourage you if you have questions about a particular slide uh, please go ahead and post that in the chat box and I will do my best to answer those as we um, go through this evening. Um, so welcome again my name is Jennifer Fishburne and I am a Extension Educator in Horticulture uh, serving Logan, Menard, and Sagamon County. And this evening's session is Growing Vegetables for Beginners. So this really is the basics. Um, so and I hope you enjoy. So I think the very first question that we ask ourselves is why might we want to grow vegetables? Um, for some of this, us, this could be because it, it is fun. Um, growing some vegetables and the satisfaction of eating produce from what you've grown uh, can be an enjoyable experience. Uh, it also provides exercise if you, if you have a larger traditional garden or you have uh, even plantings of others, uh, vegetables and herbs and flowers throughout your yard that can be a source of exercise when you're out weeding and watering and mulching. Uh, how growing your own can be a source of fresh vegetables. When we say that they may have better flavor, quality, and freshness, we're comparing that to the grocery store, but you may also get some great vegetables as well from your farmer's market. The other thing we find is that freshly picked produce, produce does have a higher nutritional value as compared to that that is set for three for several days. When you're growing your own vegetables, you can also select the specific cultivar that you like to grow. So you might enjoy a pink tomato versus a red tomato that you could find at the grocery store. And I think it's, it's safe to say that gardeners do tend to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables than non-gardeners. So what's your plan look like? What are you thinking about? Do you have a large yard in which you could put a traditional garden? Or do you have a small space or limited or no space where you might be looking at gardening in a container or on a patio? Or do you have no space at all so you might be looking at uh, picking up a space at a community garden? What will you grow? What do you like to eat? Or what might you like, you like to try? How much you will grow can vary based on how much space you have. And then lastly, how much do you want to invest in supplies? Do you already have some garden tools? Or is this a new venture for you that you may have to be purchasing gloves and trowels and containers and soil amendments um, to fertilizers and products for pest control? What's your available site location? For the majority of our vegetables, we're going to look at six or more hours of full sunlight, preferably the afternoon sun, as a, uh, also morning if you can get that, but afternoon is going to give us um, the brightest and the hottest. If you're just going to grow leafy greens, uh, you'd be looking at maybe four to six hours of sunlight. So if you wanted to grow lettuce, spinach, collard greens, uh, those types of uh, Vegetables will need a um, little bit less sunlight. They can get away with it because they're not producing fruit. Another consideration is how close are you to a water source? Is it available right next to the garden or might you have to transport water um, to where you're going to be gardening? If you're going to a traditional vegetable garden, and when I say traditional, I'm talking about planting in the ground, um, in your backyard or front yard. Do you have a well-drained fertile soil, uh, preferably with a pH of 6 to 7? Will this fit into your landscape? And can you make sure that your plants are going to have good air circulation? That's essential for uh, lessening the chances of diseases. Another thing to know is what is your plant hardiness zone? 
So this map here is the USDA plant hardiness zone map for Illinois. This can be viewed in a larger size on um, the internet as well. Um, but in Illinois, our zones range from 5A to 7A. So we do have a little bit of variance from one end of the state to, the, to another. What this tells us is that in those bands of different colors that we're going to be planting things at different times. So obviously in the southern tip of Illinois, we can plant uh, tomatoes several weeks before we would want to plant them in northern Illinois. So get to know your average date of your last frost and your frost-free date. So for example, in Springfield, Illinois area, the average frost-free date is April 12th or 14th. Sorry, the average, yes, I hope I said the average frost-free date. Um, there's still a chance after that date of which we could have a frost. But the last frost-free date, so a date at which we would not have, not have gotten frost after that, it can be vary from April 29th to May 12th in central Illinois. If you're needing this information for your specific location, I would encourage you to look at the Illinois State Water Survey website. They contain um, several different maps and contain historical data that would give you this information for your area. So an example would be if you wanted to plant tomatoes, they're planted around the frost-free date, whereas a watermelon would be two weeks after the frost-free date. So this is why you will want to know what these dates are for your area. At this time of year, so we're in April, um, we, can, we are certainly able to plant all of our cool season vegetables at this point. Um, so a very hardy uh, cool season vegetable would be planted four to six weeks before the average frost-free date. So that could be as, as early as Mar and mid to late March. Um, we can plant lettuce and peas and spinach, turnips and cabbage plants. Frost-tolerant plants are planted about two to three weeks before the average frost-free date. Um, so they withstand a light frost. And this would include beets, carrots, and Swiss chard. In this picture we have um, some lettuce growing. Warm season vegetables, I think we all think of tomatoes. I would hazard to guess that almost every single vegetable gardener probably has at least one tomato plant. Uh, these are planted on or after the frost-free date, and these plants can be injured if they um, are experience frost or cold. So we're looking at summer squash and, and green beans or snap beans and sweet corn and tomatoes. Warm-loving uh, plants are typically planted about a week or two after our frost-free date because they like the warm soil and warm air. So this would include okra and winter squash, cucumbers, sweet potatoes, eggplants, and peppers. So the next consideration is what are you going to grow? And I would say that this is going to depend on how much space you have to grow. So an example would be you're going to get more production from a tomato plant in a container than you would from a watermelon in a container. So you might be best to plant the tomato and if you if you don't have any additional space then it would be to purchase um, some watermelon from the farmers market. Uh, the other thing to consider is how much do you want to consume? Uh, growing up my family had a, a large traditional what I would call traditional vegetable garden and my mother not only picked the tomatoes to eat but we canned and froze um, much of the produce. Another consideration is if you do grow extra and um, you don't want to preserve it is to share that with uh, friends and neighbors as well as with um, local food banks. Match your growing conditions and your season. So some plants um, may do better in the southern tip of Illinois as opposed to northern Illinois. So you really do need to give some thought into how long uh, it's going to take a plant to mature. And then the last thing to consider is how much do you want to take care of? Realistically, I would say that 
everyone gets very, very excited about going out and purchasing seeds and plants and preparing the soil and getting everything planted. But when it comes to the middle of July and it's time to water and weed, there aren't a whole lot of people who take a lot of great joy in that. So do give that some careful consideration as to how much do you want to take care of. So if you're doing a traditional garden, we suggest that people start with about a 200 square foot space, so maybe a 10 by 20, if they have that room. Vegetable selection. So this one can take you a while, or it can be very easy. Um, you could simply go to the local garden center or hardware store and pick from the available tomatoes that they have. Or you can make it a little bit more complicated, go online, find a lot of different seed catalog companies, and have several hundred different kinds of tomato seeds to pick from. So it really depends on how much time you want to invest in your vegetable selection, as well as um, what you're looking for, what kind of taste that you're looking for, what uh, size and growth habit. So taste is, is very important to most of us, particularly in here we see a picture of a cucumber. Um, my favorite cucumber is Diva. It was an All-America selection several years ago. But your, your favorite cucumber might be something different. Another thing to consider is size and growth habit. So if you just have a small patio space, you're going to want to grow things that are bush type or have smaller growth habit as opposed to growing in a traditional garden. The other thing to consider is days to maturity. What that means is from the point that you plant it, how many days later will you be able to harvest a mature uh, produce? So a mature cucumber or a mature tomato. That may not seem as entirely important, but that can also help you um, have a continuous crop if you pick plants with different maturity. If you pick the shortest maturing tomato, it means you might have the first tomato on the block, which is important to some folks. Another thing to consider, particularly with uh, tomatoes, uh, is disease resistance. So you're going to look for initials that are going to be listed on um, the packet or on the stake that's in the pot that you're going to be purchasing. So you're going to see letters like V and F and N. And what do those mean? So V would be verticillium wilt resistant, N would be nematodes, um, and F would be fusarium resistance. And, that can, and there's others as well for tomatoes. And that's going to be important um, because we do experience a lot of tomato diseases in Illinois. The other consideration is what, are the, what is your use for the produce? So an example with uh, tomatoes, again, would be um, there are determinate and indeterminate. Determinate means the plant grows to a certain point and produces most of its fruit within a short time. So if you're going to be canning your tomatoes, it would be important possibly to have all those tomatoes mature in a close time frame so that you can get that done and out of the way. But then you might have a few indeterminate plants so you can have enjoy fruits all summer long and those plants are going to keep growing and producing. So what's going to be your source of your seeds and plants? Well, as previously mentioned, um, garden centers are a great source. Uh, many of our box stores, I, even grocery stores are now carrying a lot of produce, or excuse me, plants and seeds. Um, mail order catalogs. I've listed here, uh, it's, while it's not an EDU site, Cindy's Catalog of Garden Catalogs. And if you go on to this website, it's gardenlist.com, you will find thousands of different catalogs that can be either from mail order to um, catalogs that you can uh, have them ship the catalog to you. And it'll give you a great list of vegetables, not only vegetables, but annuals, flowers, trees, and shrubs that you can order. Uh, this may be helpful if you've never ordered from a seed catalog company before. Another source of seed is to save your own. So after you get a little bit more experience, saving your own seed is a good choice. One thing that I do tend to look for uh, is All-America Selections. All-America Selection vegetables are those that have been trialed throughout the United States and they have been selected for their overall um, quality of the produce, 
um, disease resistance and and many other characteristics as well so that's a good good place to look for um, vegetables as well You do want to make sure that any seeds that you purchase say that they're packaged for 2017, that it will ensure you that those are fresh and should be quality seeds. So anything you purchase should also be disease free and they should, should tell you that on the packet or from the company. When you're seeding your vegetable seeds such as uh, a carrot seed, um, you're going to plant that to a depth of two to three times the diameter of a seed. So a carrot seed might only have been planted about not even a quarter of an inch deep. Whereas a green bead seed would be about an inch deep because it's a lot, much larger seed to even a little bit deeper. Some of our seeds do need constant moisture to germinate. So a carrot would be a good example. After you plant that, you'd want to water down the row really well. And if you can, maybe even place a board over that to hold that moisture in for about a week until the seeds can start to germinate. The other thing your seeds will need is proper soil temperature and that's usually listed on the back of the seed packet. Uh, it'll tell you at what temperature the seed needs to germinate uh, for good growth. The seed packet is a wealth of information. It will tell you how big a plant will get, how um, much spacing on the seeds, how deep to plant the seeds, and when, even when to plant the seeds. So watering can vary depending on what, where you're planting your vegetables. If you're planting them in a traditional garden, we encourage you to, you, to have at least an inch of water per week on the garden, and that can come from rainfall or supplemental watering. When you do supplemental watering in a traditional garden space, make sure you soak to a depth of six inches. So this could be done through soaker hoses, drip irrigation, um, or if you needed to use a sprinkler system, that would work as well. Generally, you don't um, get near enough water if you're just using a hose and putting that up next to the plant. So you do want to possibly have a soaker hose system that you can turn on and let the water run for a while in a traditional garden. In containers, we're going to be checking those every single day in the heat of the summer, maybe even twice a day. We want to make sure when we do water a container that it thoroughly moistens the soil until the water runs out the holes in the bottom of the container. Weed control. So the advantage of planting in containers or raised beds is going to be that you should have uh, in a raised bed little to no weeds and in a container you should not have any weeds at all. In a traditional garden is where we do tend to see weed pressure and we want to make sure that we remove those weeds as early as we can when they're small and young before they even decide that they want to set seed or flower um, and what we have to remember is that weeds compete for available moisture, they compete for nutrients, and they compete for sunlight. When you do cultivate in your garden, either hand pull your weeds or lightly hoe them. You want to make sure that you're not disturbing the root system of the vegetables that are nearby. My favorite thing to do is to mulch my garden. So immediately after I plant it, I like to go in with uh, loosened up straw um, over some six, six sheets of black and white newspaper and that tends to keep the weeds down as well as to help hold moisture into the soil longer so it's a little bit more consistent moisture as well. And you could do the same thing around your containers if you wanted to put mulch on those. One of the next things we need to unfortunately consider is pest pest control practices. So how are we going to handle it when, in this picture as we see here, we have squash bugs on our squash plants? And trust me, when you see two squash bugs, you need to squish them because they will quickly multiply and uh, take over the plants in your garden, particularly your squash plants. Some of the things that we can do to lessen um, weed or pest problems or insect problems is to select disease resistant plants. 
Uh, the other thing we can do to keep down insects is to keep our garden free of weeds and to use mulch. And then after each season, make sure we remove all the crop residue, but particularly the disease crop residue, and make sure that that's removed from the garden. Another thing we can do to lessen disease problems is stay out of the garden or not work the plants um, when they're wet. And if you're using a container, be sure that with vegetables you use a new soil mix each year. Uh, the soil mixes can carry over disease and insect problems. And then get to know what the problem is and treat it properly. If you don't know where to start, call your local extension office and you, they'll usually have a hort educator or a master gardener that can help you uh, figure out what your problem might be. Okay, the next most important thing is when, when are we going to harvest? At what point do we need to harvest our produce? The thing we need to remember is that quality does not improve after we harvest. I think we can all relate to this if we purchase tomatoes or, or strawberries in the grocery store in the wintertime. Um, if they're green, they don't, they don't get any better tasting. Uh, so we want to make sure we harvest at the peak of, of the flavor and nutrition for that plant. So the best thing I could tell you is if you're not sure, um, you do, might want to visit a local grocery store or you can visit a local farmer's market and see what size the produce is that they have. Another good place to look is on the web at the University of Illinois Extension Watch Your Garden Grow Vegetable Directory. That will give you detailed information on every single vegetable that you would grow in your garden, telling you what size to harvest them at, and also then how to handle the produce after harvesting, how to store them. So if we're to harvest um, too early, the plants, the vegetables aren't going to have uh, flavor, and if we pick them too late, they're going to usually be tough and fibrous. Always make sure you handle your produce carefully as to not bruise it, so you can um, keep it longer. So basic tools, what might you need? And this is, again, going to vary based on the size of your garden. If you're gardening in a container, you're going to need container, potting media, possibly garden gloves, a watering can or a garden hose, and a journal of some type. But if you're going to be gardening in a raised bed, a traditional garden, or a community garden, you're going to want to have some tools available as well, such as a trowel or a hoe, a garden rake, or a spade. Other things that you might consider having or being ready to purchase is fertilizer, caging material for tomatoes, a garden sprayer, and most importantly, if you're going to be out in the sun for a while, to have hot and sunscreen and a bottle of water when you're out doing your gardening activities. Uh, we used to tell folks to, you know, have a paper journal available to them, something, a notebook, anything you can write in. That's going to help you keep track of what you grew, when you planted it, when you noticed problems, and when you harvested things, and whether or not you liked that specific um, vegetable that you grew. Um, but today, there are also a lot of good gardening apps that you can also um, keep this information on as well. Garden where you can. So everybody has an opportunity to probably garden somewhere, whether it's on that little small patio or the local community garden. This picture here is of a rooftop garden. So in downtown Springfield, we have, as many other communities, we have a restaurant that has a rooftop, and that's where they grow some of their produce that they use in their restaurant. Um, here in this picture, we see Swiss chard growing in a type of a milk crate that has landscape fabric as the lining and then the soil inside that. And that's a good way to do that. It keeps the air flow going through the container. Um, and you can see it, they're growing quite well. Also on his rooftop, just as a side note, he also has a couple of beehives. So planting in a small space can actually be more efficient. You can actually pack more into sometimes into small, con into containers in a small space than you might in traditional row gardens. 
The thing to remember is just to have a large enough container that it will support the root growth of the plant you're wanting to grow. So example, a tomato or a cucumber might need a five gallon container, whereas a pepper plant might only need a gallon or two container. And that means um, how much soil you can put into the container. Another thing to consider is gardening right into our landscape. Um, used to be we didn't want fruits and vegetables in the front yard. Nowadays, we really start to encourage people to do that, not only for ourselves, but also for um, birds and other wildlife as well. Um, now, some of you may be seeing I already have enough deer or rabbits in my yard, um, but um, there are a lot of birds that will benefit from some of our edible um, fruits. So we can actually incorporate vegetables, herbs, nuts, fruits, and edible flowers into our landscape. Um, they can both be aesthetically pleasing and have food value either for us or the wildlife. When you're doing this, you'll want to consider how big the plant's going to get, maybe what texture it has, what form, what color, so it will blend nicely into your uh, area. This picture here and then the next one that we see, those are both from Rosalind Creasy's Edible Landscaping. Um, she's written a book as well as she has a very nice website on edible landscaping. In this picture here, we can see that she has uh, some type of a squash, such as zucchini growing. She also has basil and tomatoes and peppers and marigolds and assorted other annuals and perennials mixed together to make a very attractive um, border landscape. Uh, you can see it has a variety of color and everything, just, even the, the textures of the squash blend nice, ni nicely with the plants around them. This is another type of container that we see here. This is again Swiss chard growing in a hypertufa type container, which is a concrete mix. The, this has been homemade container. The main thing to remember is with all containers is they have to have drainage holes. Drainage holes are essential so that the water doesn't perch inside the container and create root rot situations. The other important factor with containers is that you select quality growing media. So typically the brand names um, are, are good choices, um, but get to, you know, try a couple of them. Um, if you're going to grow two tomatoes, try two different growing medias to see which one might work better for you. When you're growing in containers, um, do consider plants that have compact uh, bush or dwarf type cultivars. Uh, they will give you, um, you'll be able to fit more into a smaller space. And again, as mentioned before, allow proper root, root space for your plants and try not to overcrowd them. If you're looking for more information on container gardening, Iowa State Extension has a very nice fact sheet on container gardening, um, giving you different container sizes for what you want to grow, as well as cultivar selections um, for gardening in containers. Here we have a picture of a grow bag. These are breathable felt uh, type fabric. Um, they are, work well because they do provide good aeration. So this is a breathable bag. The air can flow through it. Um, it also promotes a good strong root system by having good aeration. Uh, also, you don't have to worry too much about drainage. They don't have drainage holes, but the fabric is uh, where water can flow out of it. The other nice thing about these is these are reusable. In this grow bag, we do have growing uh, sweet potatoes, and we did get a very nice harvest from this bag. Another thing to consider in your traditional gardens is to garden vertically. You can also do this in containers as well. It gets the vegetable plants up off the ground and uh, keeps the produce off the ground. So this is pretty essential for grow growing tomatoes is that we uh, keep those plants up off the ground. It helps lessen disease issues and, and usually will get a more desirable fruit to harvest. So tomatoes, um, smaller cucumbers, melons, small melons, and, and some squashes are, are good choices for growing vertically. 
Here's an example of a um, PVC pipe vertical hoop structure in which uh, you could grow cucumbers on this and you'd be able to easily harvest them from the outside and then just walk right through and harvest them from the inside. So probably less likely that you would miss those cucumbers when you're picking them um, and they'd be um, a little bit more accessible, particularly if you had um, issues getting down on the ground, this might be a good option for you. Also gets the plant up um, off the ground um, and takes up a little bit less space that way. Here's another example of vertical gardening. This is um, actually trellising peas here. Uh, this is uh, a string um, type of fencing that you can purchase and then this is tied on to bamboo stakes. Um, again, this works well for peas or pole beans and you can produce a lot more growing vertically um, in this manner. Some of you may have heard of straw bale gardening and this um, does work. Uh, the biggest key with the straw bale gardening is you do have to condition the bales. Um, they can be placed anywhere that you have full sun. And then when you're finished with a bale at the end of the season, you could use it as mulch or compost. In this picture, you may not be able to see it very well, but there are sweet potatoes growing in this straw bale. And we did harvest numerous pretty large sized sweet potatoes um, from this. And if you're looking for more information on straw bale gardening, Washington State University Extension has a very nice fact sheet on how to get started and how to condition your bales. And you can usually buy a straw bale for about five or six dollars or even less depending on um, if you have to purchase it from a from a rural farm store or if you're purchasing it from a local farmer. Or maybe you have some leftover from a Halloween display that you had. Another option is go to garden and raise beds. I hear every spring people say, I can't get into my garden, it's too wet, it holds the moisture too long. In a raised bed, you can actually get into them much quicker in the spring because the soil will warm out up faster. They're usually also a good choice if you have a heavy clay soil or um, just that your pH isn't correct or you may have some other type of issues with your soil it allows you that opportunity to garden above above what might not be desirable. It's also easier for people that may have physical limitations to reach the produce. Typically with a raised bed, uh, we would make it four feet wide and uh, as long as you wanted, but you wouldn't want to make it any wider than four feet so you could it would be easily accessible from all side from the two sides. This is an example of an um, elevated raised bed and this is using actually the square foot gardening um, style of gardening in these raised beds but you can see that it's resting on some concrete blocks up off the ground so this would be uh, a nice choice for somebody in a wheelchair or possibly somebody who um, is not able to stand or to kneel or get down on the ground they can stand and garden. So raised beds can be also be used for other solutions, as I mentioned, drainage problems. So here we see some idle um, in the fall, winter time raised beds. Um, all looks well. And then the late spring, summer rains come and the area is flooded. Uh, so this um, backyard gardener really doesn't have any other options. It just is an area where it's low and his neighbors have the same issue, it retains water, um, and so his option was to grow, go up. And you could see that the plants do survive through this um, and that water will disappear in a short time, um, but it does get the plants up off the ground so they don't flood. Sometimes we have to garden in the front yard because that might be the only available sunlight that we have. So here's a picture of somebody's uh, front yard just to the side of their driveway. 
um, and just a, just a few feet actually and then the neighbor's yard starts. But you can see there's some green boxes here and those are utility boxes. So in this case they could not till the ground as they did not want to um, cut any utility lines so they went above the ground. So this was a nice choice for this space. Do keep in mind though if the utility lines do run under these um, raised beds that the utility company does have the right to have you move them if they need to work on them. These beds are 4 by 8 in size and they're about 12 inches tall. They actually are made of two, um, two by sixes on um, each side. So this is the garden in its full uh, glory and this gardener selected to plant annuals in the front for some nice color and then the vegetables are behind um, what you can see here. In this case there's many raised bed um, patterns out there. There's actually also a lot of raised bed kits nowadays that you can purchase. Uh, if you're making your own do consider notching your corners that will give you better stability and if you're um, going up about uh, the foot or so you might also consider four by fours um, in the corners of your beds for a little um, added strength as well. So as we mentioned um, you can combine uh, your raised beds with square foot gardening. The term square foot gardening uh, came from Mel Bartholomew. He created or actually wrote a book on square foot gardening and it's been revised a couple of times. Um, the idea being that these can be built where you want to garden. Um, you're not tilling these beds so they're raised beds that you would not till. Um, no wasted space. You're using all the space that's available within the bed and you're providing a soil mix that has really good drainage. So the simplest version of a square foot garden is a four foot by four foot space but uh, you can also go longer you just would not go any wider. Um, again you need to be able to have the garden accessible from, the, your, from at least two sides um, and that way you're not ever stepping in it and um, decreasing the air space that's in the soil. So this is what a square foot garden might look like. Um, this one here is four foot wide and you can see that they went ahead and took um, some strips of wood and made actual one foot squares to demonstrate um, how, how, it, how you could divide out the sections. In this picture um, they have planted, this would be a spring or a fall garden and we, they have planted onions as well as some uh, cabbage um, and I think some turnip greens in here as well but you can see this is a nice spring or fall garden um, with the leafy greens in it. So I, I put this picture up here because I wanted all the plant parts to be represented and then I realized um, when I got ready to present the other day that there's one one fruit or plant part that's missing. Um, so you have the carrots for the roots, the celery for the stem, lettuce leaves uh, for leaves, tomatoes for fruit, sunflowers for seeds, and then uh, you'd have broccoli for your flowers or cauliflower to represent that you can enjoy all the plant parts um, not of every single plant but you can enjoy various plant parts and enjoy the fruits of your labor. Um, so I give uh, credit to those whose photos I used and then this is my contact information. So I did not go into any specific vegetables or specific insects or disease issues but at this time I will open up um, for any questions. If you want to put anything into the chat box I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. I'm hoping that that you have a few questions. Um, they certainly did not cover everything.
<laughs> Any suggestions for keeping rabbits out of a vegetable garden? Unfortunately, the best way to keep most of our large pests, so rabbit and deer in particular, out of our gardens is exclusion, which means um, that we are going to have to fence around our gardens. In the case of rabbits, you, you also not only need to think of fencing above ground, but you need to actually bury that fence just a little bit below ground. So what you might use is something like a chicken wire uh, poultry netting, I believe it's also called, um, and get it a little bit below ground so that the rabbits can't crawl underneath of it. Um, I believe also some hot pepper sprays work, but those require lots of diligence. Um, they are repeated applications. If it rains, you have to repeat it again. Um, so it really is best of exclusion, or maybe you can get a good dog to chase them off of your yard. Um, unfortunately, there's really not any other options. Unless somebody else has one that they want to post there. So we have a couple folks typing some questions right now. Um, in my garden right now, I have potatoes planted and onions planted, and I'm going to probably try this week to plant green beans, although it's a little bit early. Um, kind of getting anxious, so I might just put a few seeds out and, and see what happens. Um, I've missed, uh, well, not missed, it's probably not too late, but you could probably still put in some lettuce and spinach and radishes as well if you were wanting to grow some, some spring stuff. So what kind of soil mix is suggested for growing tomatoes in containers? Um, if you're familiar with the University of Illinois Extension, we cannot give out brand names of soil mixes, but I can tell you there's a lot of, or several really good brand names out there um, that work great. Um, personally, I've not had near a success with off-brand or store-brand um, potting mixes as I have with some of the name brand, but you can get them with or without uh, fertilizers in them. Um, if you tend to forget to fertilize, having something with a time-release fertilizer in it is a good idea. Also, if you tend to forget to water, um, some of them have the water-absorbing crystals that will hold moisture a little bit longer. The other thing with tomatoes, though, is you might want to make sure that um, because they do produce a lot of fruit is to um, use a water-soluble fertilizer at maybe a reduced rate every time you water as well. Um, but growing, growing your tomatoes, particularly also in new soil each year, I, I know that sounds a bit expensive, um, but I've had several gardeners who uh, had a lot of problems their second year with their tomatoes in which they grew in old soil, and part of that was, was because they carried over a disease problem. What should the minimum depth be for a tomato in a raised bed? I would say if you had a 12-inch raised bed, that that should be sufficient um, for, for a tomato, um, just giving it a little bit more uh, width, possibly, a little bit more space to grow out. Um, So somebody has asparagus that they've had about 14 years. Um, asparagus is is a great thing to grow. You do get um, from one plant, you will get many many years of enjoyment of of, of spears. Um, if you're looking to renew a bed after 14 14 to 20 years. 14 years is getting there. 20 years is usually about max for an asparagus bed. Um, I would suggest getting crowns. Um, those can be easily purchased from a lot of your mail order catalogs. They can also be purchased at the stores right now as well. Uh, Jersey Knight is a good selection. Um, keep in mind that your mailed cultivars of asparagus are go going to produce the fruit, so they're going to put more energy into root production, and that will give you usually bigger spears um, to harvest, um, whereas like a, a, a Jersey Queen um, would be uh, producing fruit 
that's a female, so you may get smaller spears from that. Uh, the other thing you need to make sure you're doing with your asparagus beds is a lot of fertility. So if you can um, get, uh, you can either purchase it, but you can also sometimes if you're, find a, uh, someone who has horses and put some horse manure on your beds. That Each year, that will definitely help with the production of your asparagus beds. Is it safe to use water absorbing crustables for plants you're eating? Um, I have not seen any information that has said otherwise. Um, that's actually a good question, but I've not seen any information. I don't know if, if Kari's still on, if she wants to chime in at all, but I personally have not seen anything that, that says that they would not be safe for, for plants that you're eating from. I haven't come across anything either. Um... And I know that in personal usage, I've had it. And, I mean, but yeah, there, if there's research out there, I haven't come across it. So, good question. How do you plant a sweet potato that's sprouting in my kitchen? Uh, that's an, that's another good question. Um, so, sweet potatoes are planted as slips. Um, I've not done it myself. I rem I don't remember in grade school. You put the sweet potato in the jar, and then it put off sprouts. Um, Kari, help me out here if you know. Um, I think you would just you would take off parts of it, it right? I'm not sure, though. Does anybody else know? I've not done that myself. Um, but you don't plant the whole sweet potato, I can tell you that. Um, because when you plant sweet potatoes, you're actually planting what they call slips. So they appear to be small baby plants. They're actually just a little little sprig with just a little bit of a root system on it. Um, I know that some people put them in, you plant them in sand. Um, you could put um, put the sweet potato itself in, in a sandy mixture, and then I think you could take the sprouts off. Anybody, anybody got, got an answer to that one? Sorry, silent. <laughs> Yeah, that one I, you know, I've actually never grown sweet potatoes. It's more than the I grow them, but I buy them in the bunch of 25 from the local uh, um, grower, and um, they work just great. Right. Do keep in mind, though, sweet potatoes are um, planted later in May. They do need it really warm. Um, I usually hill my sweet potatoes. Um, and then the other thing is, is if you if you are one of those folks that has rabbits in the area, um, you would want to uh, put a poultry netting over the plants as they're growing because they do love sweet potato foliage. Um, so it says here, when, a, when any of your vines grow to about five to six inches, pick it off at the base and place in a jar filled with water. So yeah, you're take, I think you're taking the foliage off and putting it on water so it'll actually grow um, some roots. And then they call those uh, slips that you're um, putting in the ground. But you could try that, most definitely. Other questions? Well, if you want to revisit this presentation from this, oh, we have somebody else typing, and I'll go ahead and make my comment. If you want to revisit the presentation or you know other gardening friends or those wanting to get started um, in gardening, this uh, will be posted to the University of Illinois Extension's um, Horticulture YouTube channel, and you can enjoy it for many years to come. Um, so Janie's typing a question, or typing a message, I should say. Okay, so she's getting beetles on her zucchini. Um, I don't doubt that, but the, the biggest thing that I have a problem with on zucchini plants is what we call um, a squash bug. If you, it's gray typically, and if you, if you were to step on it, it's, it, has a, it oozes out a blue uh, liquid. Um, and these, if you don't start early with squash bugs and treatment, um, you, they will take over the plant very, very quickly, and they will also munch on many of the other plants in your yard as well. Um, both the beetles, if you have beetles or squash bugs, um, really the only thing you can do, at least, that is, is either you need to go out when you first see them and hand pick them off and squish them, 
you need to make sure you kill it, destroy their egg cases. So in the, in the case of a squash bug, they're going to lay their eggs on the underside of a leaf and they're little, little brown dots in a group um, and you would want to squish those as well. Uh, you could try that and if that's not effective, unfortunately you would have to refer to an insecticide um, to treat those and any insecticides that you would use in your garden I would encourage you to spray later in the evening, so before it gets dark. Um, that's when our pollinators are going to be the least active. If you spray in the morning, you're also going to hit those pollinators um, when you're spraying. And I do not have a book right at my fingertips, but the, we do have a home yard and garden pest, uh, or excuse me, Home Pest Management for the Landscape book. It's a universal extension publication in which um, we have a couple pages of the insecticides that uh, work best for particular pest problems that you have on your vegetables. Sorry, that probably wasn't the best answer, but I have a feeling, uh, take a look at them. Um, if it's a beetle, they're going to fly. Uh, squash bugs usually don't. The other problem we do tend to see with squash early on is going to be a squash vine borer, and that is a flying insect which deposits its eggs that turn into a larva that will tunnel up through um, the squash and kill it that way. Um, so we typically don't see the damage until it's usually too late for, for a squash vine beetle. And maybe that's what you're referring to, but um, the squash vine beetles, you typically won't see them. You'll see their damage. It looks like a little sawdust at the base of the plant. Um, so there are, there are different, unfortunately, growing squash um, is typically not a pest-free endeavor. Um, Squash, you plant them and squash bugs will come. All right, well, I thank you all for being very attentive this evening. You've all stayed on and all listened to the questions, and I hope that you've gained a little bit of insight. And please, certainly, I have my email address there if you do have further questions. And Janie, if you want to send me an email, I'll be happy to get you the, the proper chemical that you um, would need for your beetles or your squash bugs as well. So um, wish you all the best in your gardening endeavors throughout the season. And if anybody has any questions, please feel free to contact myself or um, your local extension office. Hope you have a great evening. Thanks, everybody.